Matthew here from MiniWarGaming.com and it's time for another Shadows in the Warp. This is the show where I talk about all things Tyranids. In today's show, I'm going to be reviewing and talking about this Sporocyst, one of the new Tyranid models. In the second show for today, which is in the Mini Wargaming Vault, the link below, I will be talking about the Mucolid Spore Mine, which kind of goes hand in hand with the Sporocyst. So here we have the Tyranid Sporocyst. I'm going to talk about two things. One, the actual model itself, and then its rules and how that plays with the Tyranid army. So let me review the model first. In short, I love it. I already talked about the, the Tyrannocyte last week, or the last time I did Shadows in the Warp, and this one is essentially the same model, it's just basically cut off right here and stuck into the ground. There's, there are different model, like, things that you have to do modeling-wise in order to create it, but essentially it's just the same thing. And since I love the Tyrannocyte so much, I love this one too. So that's really all there is to talk about the model itself. So let's talk about its rules. Now there's, there's a, a lot of things here that are very interesting because it is a monstrous creature and yet breaks a lot of the way the monstrous creatures work. And I know there are going to be rule debates about this because I've already seen them for the Tyrannocyte. And we'll get into some of those as we go along. And I'm, telling, I'm going to tell you how we're going to play it as a house rule and hopefully FAQs and erratas will come out in order to, to clarify it. You can get the rules for free at blacklibrary.com by going to the digital edition section and click on the FAQ and errata and then click on the big button that says free downloads. You can get all the new Tyranid models. Or alternatively, you can get it from the Shield of Bale Leviathan book, that expansion, the, the campaign book. Uh, now the one thing that you're not gonna get on the Black Library site is all the other expansions, the formations. Now, the Sporosis doesn't really have a formation, but the new Mucolid and other stuff definitely do. So, rules-wise, how does this thing work? Well, despite the way that it's described in the fluff, it does not deep strike in. Instead, it has the infiltrate special rule. It is totally immobile. It's like a tick stuck into your arm. Oh, can you imagine? Oh man, that would hurt. But anyway, so when you're playing the game, you can bring them as heavy support choices, and instead of deploying as normal, they do Infiltrate. Now, Infiltrate also grants them the Outflank special rule, but because they are immobile, if you choose to put them in, de in, in Outflank reserve, they're essentially just gonna be dead right away because when they do come in, you go to Outflank them, but they can't move, therefore they don't come on the board, therefore at the end of the game, they're counted as destroyed. So don't Outflank them, just Infiltrate them. Infiltrating will give them interesting uh, advantages because if, if you think about infiltrate, a lot of people might think infiltrating is all about getting closer to your enemy, and that's true, but it's also about just deploying after your enemy has deployed. And if you if are the one deploying first, that's a huge advantage, because these could just be plunked down right in the, your side of the table on top of an objective, and there you go, you're done. So since they are still scoring, even though they're on mobile, the infiltrate will be really nice for that. Uh, alternatively, if your opponent decides to like, bunch up in a corner, you could even stick it on their side of the board as long as you're at least 18 inches away. It's very rare that you can deploy within 12 inches with Infiltrate because most of the time, even when you have a lot of terrain on the board, something is going to be able to see it. And as soon as one thing can see it, it can't deploy within 12 inches. So it is fearless and does not have instinctive behavior. And on top of that, it is a Synapse node thingy-mabob. And what that means, and that's the, the official thing is mabob, thingy-mabob, is that a Synapse creature that is within six inches of this guy will have their Synapse range increased by six inches. You combine that with all the other things that can increase your, your Synapse range, like the Norn Crown or Dominion or a lot of the formations that are out there, or the one Warlord trait, and you could really have some nice long Synapse ranges. So it's useful for that, and because of how big it is, if you look at the size of its base, it's actually quite large. It's not very hard to have some synapse creature within six inches of it in order for it to get that advantage. It's not always going to come into play, but it's a nice little extra that it does come with. By default, it comes with five death spitters, but just like the Tyrannocyte, you can spend an extra 25 points and turn those all into barb stranglers or into venom cannons. Now you might think, well, that would be the whole point of this thing. It seems to be like this bastion of some sort of uh, proportion. And it does seem to be designed that way, but it has some other really interesting rules. For example, every shooting phase, at the beginning of every shooting phase, it can produce three spore mines, or once per game, one mucolid mine. And uh, the, these, these are just placed within six inches and then they get to act as normal after that. And because they're not coming in from reserve, we had the same interesting quandary as we do with the Biovore who fires and misses. When a Biovore fires and misses, or a Biovore brood, 
where that misses, you place d3 spore mines, assuming it didn't go off the table. And since it says that they're displaced and it doesn't say they came in from reserve, a lot of people are talking about the fact that they can charge into close combat the same turn that they arrived. And I looked at the rules and I realized rules is written, that is totally it. So if you play that way with the biovores, where the spore mines when they arrive can charge, then it actually works the same way for this thing because it doesn't say they disembark six inches. It doesn't say specifically they can't charge. All it says, spore node, a model with a special rule can produce a spore mine cluster with three, three spore mines in a shooting phase in addition to any attacks it makes. Place the spore mines wholly within six inches of the model in unit coherency and not in impassable terrain. After they are placed, the spore mines are treated as a separate unit for the rest of the battle. And then once per battle, it can do a mucolid, um, a mucolid spore instead, but not, not a three of them, just one of them. And so since it's placed, it's not disembarked, it didn't come in from reserve, it didn't deep strike, it doesn't specifically say it can't charge, they can actually, by rules as written, are able to charge. It seems kind of strange, and I wouldn't be surprised if that gets FAQ'd or ratted out later on, but as for we have it right now, just like with the Biovores, that is rules as written. And so that's, that provides a really interesting thing, because you get two or three of these, and you kind of stick them around, and once the enemy is close to you, all of a sudden you're providing spore mines that can assault them the same turn that they're created. And they might have charged you already and be locked in combat, and you're able to send this basically to strength six blast, because with three spore mines, it's strength four, five, six, large blast. That just hits at initiative 10, so it can be quite effective that way. And then the mucolid one, of course, being strength eight, AP three. And then we have the same rules for the guns as we do with the Tyrannocyte, which brings up some really interesting questions, one of which I already covered with the Tyrannocyte, but another of which I came across in somebody's comment that I hadn't thought of before. The first one that we already talked about, the Tyrannocyte, is the rule for these is that at the end of the shooting phase, before the morale checks are made, these guns fire. So they fire automatically at Ballistic Skill 2 at the nearest enemy unit within line of sight. And uh, if you do rules as written, monstrous creatures don't have a line of fire for each of their weapons. They're just, they, basically all their weapons can be fired from any point on the base which means you just find the nearest model or nearest unit to them and all five weapons should be able to fire at it. But when you read in the White Dwarf that introduced these, it talked about how you measure from the end of each gun to fire at each of the enemies. So this brings up two issues. One, uh, the rules as written is not correct. And that obviously because of the way they talk about in the White Dwarf, that's not what they intended. And so you have all these things like, okay, so they fire, it does say they can fire at, at different units which if you just follow the rules as written, doesn't make sense because they'd all fire at the same unit because that would be the closest one, unless there happens to be more than one that are exactly the same distance away, in which case it's the only part where that rule comes into play. And so you have that, you, so you have like, you can fire at different ones and they're supposed to measure from the gun itself, but are they 45 degree arc or are they 100 degree or 180 degree arc? I'm not quite sure. They kind of look hall mounted, but maybe they'll turn out to be like turret or sponsons or who knows what. So. The rules are very unclear there. Furthermore, somebody else pointed out that monstrous creatures can only fire two weapons per shooting phase, and Tyranids don't have a special rule against that. However, when we read the rule for them firing, it says each weapon on this model automatically fires at the nearest enemy unit within range and line of sight. The shots are resolved at the end of the shooting phase before morale checks are taken. So it specifically says that every weapon is fired. Each weapon on this model automatically fires, not Mo weapons on this model automatically fire. It says each of them, so it specifically is saying that all of them are going to fire. So that trumps our normal two shots. So as much as I love this model, the rules as written are very, very poorly done. Uh, it's just it's not very clear. Uh, and, and that's the fact that they do have a facing, as we know, is in White Dwarf, and they showed that that's the intent, but now that everybody reads the White Dwarf, people are just gonna download these off the internet or get it in the Shield of Bale book, which doesn't actually talk about what the White Dwarf talked about. And so they would play those rules as written, which is just, which is really, I like the rules as written better than intended, because I just would rather just choose one unit within, uh, that's closest to it and have all five of them fire at it, especially when you switch it out for the Barb Strangler or a Despot, or all of a sudden you're dropping five large or small blasts on the target unit rather than having to fire them all separately at different units. And then most of the time you're not gonna be able to fire all five of them because there's not gonna be stuff on every single um, side of it because you're infiltrating them, which means you're not gonna get them past maybe like the 18 inch mark 
If you're lucky, you can get up to the 24 inch mark, but it's gonna be very rare that all five weapons will have a target. And so like, you can see that's what they intended, but it's kind of weird. So how does this fit into the Tyranus strategy? Are these worthwhile to bring? Well, they're only 75 points. They do take up a heavy support slot, which is, which is unfortunate. I kind of wish that they did the same thing as a Tyrannosite, which is that um, they don't take up a Force Org slot, or maybe make them fast attack. I know they're not fast. It's just, I just don't want them to take up a heavy support slot because I love my Biovores and I love my uh, Tyrannifexes and even Carnifexes are great and Trigons are great. So this is going to compete for that. So in, in tournament scenes where you're min-maxing, I don't know if you're going to see these very often. Sure, they have their ability to create spore mines. Sure, they have their ability to increase synapse range. But overall, tactically, I don't think they're going to be the best choice. Having said that, that doesn't mean you're not going to see them in all sorts of battle reports where I use them because I love using a variety of models. And so it looks like a flower from this point of view. That's kind of, that's very pretty. But uh, I will be using them. But where do I think they're useful? Well, obviously they provide a bit of firepower. Obviously they increase synapse range. But I think that that whole, until it's FAQ'd or ratted, being able to create spore mines that can charge that same turn, that will be useful. Because otherwise you're creating spore mines that are just gonna slowly drift. But if you bring two or three of these, let's say you're doing an unbound list, because that's the only time you're gonna be able to bring a lot of these without, um, without having any problems trying to fill out other slots then you can produce a lot of spore mines every turn. Your opponent's not gonna want to shoot at these because they're just, it's almost not quite worth it. They are five toughness, so they could be insta-killed as strength 10, but they got six wounds. Not only a four plus save, but six wounds, which means they're gonna have to dedicate a lot of firepower to take it down. Even with heavy bolters, they're wounding on five, so they gotta hit it a lot of times before they can kill it. Give it a tiny bit of cover, and all of a sudden it's, it's a monster's creature. You deploy it, in ruins or in a forest and automatically it's almost always going to have some sort of cover save which will make it that much more durable. So they're going to be annoying, that is for sure. They do take up a lot of space so you have to think about that for your deployment but I think they'll be fun to play with for just pumping up spore mines who then charge automatically into close combat. The mucolid of course, I'm going to talk about that in the next video but uh, if there is a flyer nearby then dropping the mucolid down and having it charge might be useful. Although I'll give a full review on what I think about the Mucolid in the next video. So yes, cool model. Will it be very competitive? I don't think so. Will you see it in future battle reports? Of course, because it is cool looking. It's like basically a piece of tyranid terrain, which I just love. So let me know what you think about this, how you think it should be used, how you think the rules should be interpreted at the comment section below. And go ahead and click the link below to go and watch the video about the Mucolid spore mine. This big one right here, look at the size of that. It's like the size of my head. Ha, just kidding, that's just perspective. Anyway, and this one will of course be in the vault for vault members only. If you're a vault member, just click the link and you can go watch it. If you're not a vault member, you can still click the link, get a seven day free trial and check it out right away. If you don't like the vault, just cancel. You can cancel at any time. And we will not charge you if you decide to cancel. But we don't think you will. The majority of people stay. And that supports us and allows us to make these videos, which we really, really appreciate. So thanks for watching and happy wargaming.